In this video, I am going to try to tell you the story about my motorcycle trip across the USA, which took place from August 6th to August 30th, 2017. And I can tell you straight away, I am going to fail to tell you this story. Partly, this is because after exactly four years have gone by, I've forgotten most of what happened on this trip. All I really have to go off of are a handful of Facebook posts, uh, 12 hours of this mostly crappy video footage you're watching now, and my terrible memory. So whatever this video ends up being through this process of writing and recording, voiceover, research and editing, I can tell you for certain what this story won't be. It won't be the truth. You're not going to know what really happened in my life and in my brain between August 6th and August 30th, 2017. What you're going to get instead is a reflection of what happened. Ghostly apparitions of what I really thought and felt and learned during the voyage, which have transformed and mutated through the years into these new constructions, which I don't even know what you call them. Uh, memories, I guess. Of course, it's not like any of this matters to you, just because this was a completely transformative experience for me, one that completely changed the course of my life and my understanding of life itself, that doesn't mean it's going to have the same significance for you, and it would be pretty silly for us to expect that. In fact, that's one of the things that I really hate about a lot of travelogues. Travel is a life-changing experience for the individual in many cases, but it's not really something that can be translated easily through retelling. There's a very, very small number of people who can write good travelogues with that kind of vivid humanity that gives you a glimpse into the transformative process of traveling through this world. And one of those rare storytellers was Ernesto Che Guevara. In his motorcycle diaries, Guevara explained, in nine months of a man's life, he can think a lot of things from the loftiest meditations on philosophy to the most desperate longing for a bowl of soup in total accord with the state of his stomach. And if, at the same time, he's somewhat of an adventurer, he might live through episodes of interest to other people, and his haphazard record might read something like these notes. Now, make no mistake, I am no Che Guevara. Ooh, I'm tired. And I am not comparing myself to Che Guevara in this video, unless it's to say I don't compare to Che Guevara in any way, because uh, for one thing, Che Guevara was a brave <laughs> revolutionary figure who changed the course of human history. Uh, and I'm a fucking YouTuber. Uh, but even my trip, you know, pales in comparison to Che Guevara's. My 25 day trip across the USA on a relatively modern and somewhat reliable motorcycle was not nearly as incredible and daring and dangerous as Che's nine month long treacherous voyage across South America on undeveloped back roads using a much less reliable machine that predated World War II and died halfway through his journey. Basically, what I'm saying is, Instead of watching this video, you might want to consider just reading Guevara's Motorcycle <laughs> Diaries. There's a link in the description. And uh, yeah, if, if the only thing that happens from this video is a few of you go out and read the Motorcycle Diaries, then I guess it was worth putting this together. But anyway, I've decided that uh, the fact that I don't compare to Che Guevara in any way whatsoever uh, shouldn't stop me from, from making this video and trying to tell this story. Because I do feel like there's something that can be gleaned from these experiences. It did happen at a strange time. It happened during 2017 when Donald Trump was, you know, just starting out his presidency. Uh, a lot of us were going through political changes at this time. And, you know, I started 2017 more or less as a, as a, as a liberal. And I ended 2017 uh, starting the blog that would become this YouTube channel. Uh, you know, and it really, this was the time when I became an anti-capitalist, uh, anarcho-communist. And so uh, this this journey was a big part of that, you know, and it's, it, it's significant that it happened halfway through the year. It's significant that uh, I experienced a lot of things that I had never experienced before on this journey. And it all played into my, you know, more, um, I guess, meta journey <laughs> uh, of, of, po of political advancement from the center to the, to the left. Uh, but a part of me certainly hesitates to tell this story to anyone, because up until now, this hasn't really been a story. It's been memory. It's been my memory preserved in situ in my mind. I've never really sat down with anyone else and fully recounted everything that happened on this trip. And 
In recounting it here, I'll be transforming this loose assortment of scattered memories that are spiriting around in my brain into a structured narrative. And in this process, my memories will also change and reshape themselves to conform to the narrative that I'm building. A long time ago, I, I watched an interview with someone. I, I, ironically, I can't remember who it was, but they were talking about the death of a loved one. And, and when the interviewer asked this person to talk about their loved one's last moments of, of life, this person had you know, been at the deathbed when this person passed away, uh, the, the person refused to tell that story. And they said something along the lines of, uh, I can't remember exactly, obviously, but they said, uh, you know, I don't talk about those moments of, of this loved one's death because every time you talk about an experience, you transform it, you cheapen it, you change those memories. And before long, the story replaces the memories and it loses its depth and it becomes something less real, less complex. It just becomes this story and that replaces the memories in your in your mind. I really wish I could remember who said that, but I guess it's somehow suitable that my memory fails me here. The French philosopher Jacques Derrida spoke of this phenomenon in his lecture Nemocene. I don't know how you say that. Who can really tell a story, asks Derrida. Is narrative possible? Who can claim to know what a narrative entails? or before that, the memory it lays claim to. So Derrida understood that we must choose between memories and stories. If we decide to tell the story, the memory becomes lost. But on the other hand, as Derrida puts it, in keeping the memory, the narrative is lost. So all my life, I've wanted to tell stories. I've always felt that stories and narratives are some of the best ways of preserving human life experiences for future generations. As Carl Sagan wrote, one glance at a book and you hear the voice of another person, perhaps someone dead for a thousand years. To read is to voyage through time. But it's only in more recent years that I've come to understand that storytelling is also a destructive process, especially when we tell stories which are drawn from our memories. And that's part of why I haven't made a video about my motorcycle trip across the USA until now, because this was a profound experience for me, and I want to tell it properly. I want to get it right. But the farther I travel away from those events through time, the more I realize that I will never be able to get it right, because the significance of those events have also changed through time. So when I was actually out there on the road, a lot of the time I'm pretty sure that I felt kind of bored or miserable, terrified, but there were also obviously moments of wonder and awe and you know, I had a full range of emotions and they were very, very deep. Then immediately after completing the trip, uh, I felt this great sense of satisfaction and accomplishment and pride. And, you know, it, it, the, the, the essence of the trip sort of transformed in my mind. It, it went from being something that I was engaged in actively into a notch on my belt, something that I finished, something that I could move on from and, you know, just kind of look back on as, as this uh, victory. Uh, then a few months later, it virtually disappeared from my consciousness altogether, and I became consumed with other things in life, starting this channel. You know, this trip just kind of faded into the background. I didn't really think about it for quite some time. And now today, when I look back at it, uh, it, it has a different significance, because looking back now, I feel like I changed as a person in a, in a deep and profound way in that journey. But they didn't really feel that way at the time. I didn't have any consciousness of any kind of, you know, majestic transition when I was actually out there on the road. So over the years, I've reprocessed and reinterpreted this trip across the USA countless times, and it is possible, even probable, that I've mythologized this trip. In organizing my memories of this period of my life, my brain has transformed the stream of consciousness, which I actually experienced through the weeks of the trip itself, into a more orderly narrative. And my consciousness has also imbued this narrative with meaning and significance and context that I'm pretty sure wasn't there when I was actually waddling into a gas station, for instance, with a saddle sore ass to buy a moon pie somewhere in the middle of Idaho. So yes, my brain has been constructing these experiences into a narrative. And as I write and, and now record these words, 
that narrative develops more structure. It changes, and then those memories, those raw memories of the experience fade and merge into this narrative that's being constructed. So how can I properly tell this story? How can I tell this story? I could approach this story like a journalist and just try to recount exactly what happened without any sentiment whatsoever in a flatly detached detailing of events, you know, just say what happened in the order in which the events occurred. But even this kind of historical documentation is a form of mythology. It is the mythology of journalism. It's the lie we tell ourselves that historical accounts can ever be neutral. There's no such thing as neutrality in any kind of storytelling, including journalism and history. Narrative building is a filtration process. It is a destructive process which sorts out some events as significant and worth telling and worth preserving in history, in the record, while other events are buried and concealed forever. Even if I just decided to upload the 12 hours of raw footage from my trip to YouTube without comment, I would be filtering out information because the most significant things that happened on this trip happened off camera. Virtually none of the conversations I had with other people along the way were recorded. There were so many times when I was really tired or frustrated or scared and I, I didn't bother with reaching for a camera. And then there are the things that really don't belong on video, like the 30 or 40 times I went out into the desert or the woods or the swamp well away from the road with a shovel and a roll of toilet paper to do things you probably don't want to see in a YouTube video. And those events were actually in many ways very definitive of the trip. They, they were a big part of the trip, but they're also the sorts of experiences that usually get left out of even the most detailed historical and journalistic accounts. And maybe there's good reason for that. Although I should mention, Che Guevara did talk a lot about pooping in the motorcycle diaries. So maybe it's, uh, maybe it is worth mentioning. But anyway, no, I'm not going to try to even pretend that I can tell this story from a neutral perspective. The myth that journalism and history can ever be neutral, that, that, that any storytelling can ever be neutral, is really actually quite harmful. Because it's this kind of myth which has led to such a powerful ideological hegemony in the USA, which has most Americans believing that they are neutral in their beliefs, especially in their political beliefs, when in reality they are adhering to very extremist beliefs uh, of a status quo which is dominated by capitalist, white supremacist, patriarchal power structures in our society. So no, I'm not going to try to pretend to be neutral in telling this story. So how can I tell this story? I, I could go in the opposite direction and forget the facts altogether to focus on the emotions I felt, the extreme highs and lows, the ups and downs, the times when I felt the trip would end in defeat, the, the times when I really thought for sure that I might die, the, the encounters I had with wild nature, the feelings of wondrous insignificance I felt as I looked over stunning natural wonders day after day after day on this journey. But if I'm being honest, all that remains of those feelings in my mind today are the dullest echoes. Try as I might, I can't really capture the feelings of cresting a hill and seeing a dizzying desert vista opening before my eyes, or, or the comical terror I felt one night in the, in the middle of uh, nowhere in Idaho in the, in the pitch black darkness when I heard a raccoon, I later found out it was a raccoon messing with my stuff outside of my tent, but at the time I thought for sure it was a bear, and I was clutching my bear spray close and uh, feeling in danger of my life, but it was only after going out with a flashlight that I discovered it was just a friggin' raccoon. And um, yeah, no, fortunately there was nobody there to laugh at me, but I guess you can laugh at me now. But anyway, uh, I also felt desolate frustration when I ran out of gas one time and I was low on water in a particularly empty stretch of desert highway and it took hours before somebody came to come and drive me to the gas station. But looking back now, I don't really feel those emotions nearly as strongly as I did at the time. So if I can't even recall these real, deep, visceral emotions of this trip in my own mind, how could I hope to convey them to you through words or even images? Even reading back these words right now on the page, they feel empty and hollow in comparison to what I know I felt on the journey. So forget it. I give up on trying to describe these memories in terms of emotion. That's not something I feel like I'm capable of doing. So how can I tell this story? 
I could focus on the more physical elements of the trip, such as my only traveling companion through the journey, a 1999 BMW R1200C, which I picked up in San Francisco. I managed to buy this beautiful motorcycle for a couple thousand dollars because it was a salvage title. It's a really weird bike. It's styled sort of like an American cruiser, but it has that classic BMW boxer engine and a super comfortable and relaxed upright driving position. I could tell you about how I built a luggage rack out of Home Depot hardware and I had to constantly adjust and redesign my setup for carrying equipment as I went along through the weeks of the voyage. I, I could talk about the gear that I use, some of which I loved, like the double rainbow tarp tent, which is the best tent I've ever owned in my life, and some of which I came to loathe, like the Sony Action Cam, which was, has terrible battery life and produces terribly shaky footage when clamped to a motorcycle, although the little uh, wrist strap monitor remote control thing is pretty cool. I just wish the battery didn't suck so much more than anything. Anyway, I could talk about the clothes that I wore, the breathable long underwear, which made even the hottest deserts feel kind of tolerable. I, I really recommend you wear these, this kind of underwear if you, if you go on this kind of trip. Uh, the armored leather jacket and pants and the fancy and expensive airbag crash vest, which fortunately I never really had to put to use on the trip. But eh, this isn't really a gear channel uh, or a motorcycle channel. And this isn't the sort of thing that most people are gonna be interested in, even though it was certainly one of the most important parts of the voyage, these material things which carried me literally along the way. But but um, I guess I do have to show the one crash I had on the trip, somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in Oregon. Yeah, remember boys and girls, use the rear brake and gravel or this could happen to you. I was fine thanks to all that armor, but it did result in some mechanical problems which plagued me for the rest of the trip. But you know, those details really are, are pretty mundane and boring, truth be told. And I, I guess if I ever start a gear review channel, I'll let you know, but for now, let's just skip the stuff. Uh, so, so how can I tell the story? <laughs> Well, I could start at the beginning, but where does the story even begin? Does it begin on August 6th when I left Oakland, California to journey north along the California coastline up into Oregon for a camping trip with some of my old friends? Uh, or does it start before that in June and July when I attended the Middlebury Summer Language Program, another incredibly transformative experience I had in 2017 where I could only read, write, speak, and listen to Korean for eight weeks. And during this time, I lived on the gorgeous campus of Mills College, which was the first women's college west of the Rockies. And I spent a minimum of about 12 hours every single day during this program studying Korean. It was the most challenging thing I have ever done in my entire life. Uh, I, you know, there were times whenever I was about to break down and quit. Uh, there were times of, of joy. There were times of, of deep frustration. I, there was drama. There was all kinds of things that happened during this, you know, compressed into this two-month period of time. Uh, and just being forced to speak and listen and, and, and engage in a foreign language for two months straight, uh, it, it changes you. In, in really profound ways, and I'm really glad I had that experience. But unfortunately, I don't really have a lot of documentation of this. I do have this uh, beautiful footage of a traditional Korean music performance, which I, I was I had the great fortune to be able to tape. Um, and I have this recording of a presentation I gave on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in Korean. 안녕하세요, 여러분. 안녕하세요. 제 이름은 Aaron이에요. 그리고 오늘 우리가 그 닌자 가부기 대해서 Ninja Kabuki Alayo? Yeah. Sony Nulayo? Oh, ne? Grigo? Ah, Irani Moyo? Donatello. Mikoranjaro? Oh, Donatello. Donatello. Sonia? Leonardo. Leonardo. And on the motorcycle trip, I spent a lot of time processing those experiences in Oakland and reminiscing about them and, you know, filing away all those things that happened in such a short period of time in my brain. It took a lot of brain power just to process that on those long, long stretches of highway. But somehow, I, I just don't think that that's going to translate well into a narrative about a motorcycle trip. I, 
I don't even know if I could explain it to you. It's just something you got to do. If you ever get the chance to do a two month intensive language program, uh, I really recommend you, you give it a shot. It is very, very difficult, but very awesome and amazing. Uh, and it's worth all the frustration. So yeah, but that's not the story that, uh, that I'm trying to tell. So how can I tell this story? I could tell you about how much I learned about the USA on this trip, because I did see parts of the country that I've never been in in my entire life. I never really went to the West Coast for more than a couple of days uh, before in my life. And, you know, spending all this time out in the West and in the desert and then, you know, just journeying through these these parts of the country I've never been to. I did have a lot of conversations with people who, you know, and I realized that there are all these different cultural encampments across the USA. But uh, on the other hand, most of those conversations were honestly pretty superficial. Uh, you can only ha learn so much in a conversation that lasts five or 10 minutes at a gas station or a restaurant. Uh, you know, some, some of the conversations were longer, but, but for the most part, it really felt more like a, a solitary experience. And I think I would, it would probably be pretty dishonest for me to try to pretend that I learned a whole lot about my fellow U.S. Americans <laughs> on, on this trip. In fact, if there's one feeling that really comes to mind when I think back on this trip, it is solitude. Uh, if there's one thing that you realize when you're doing a trip coast to coast across the USA, it's how extremely empty so much of the land is in terms of human development. There are places where you can ride for hours and hours without seeing any evidence at all that humans even exist, except for that endless stretch of road sprawling out before you. And this uh, is a quite different from, you know, Vietnam, where I've also done a lot of motorcycle trips. In Vietnam, you know, of course you can get out to some remote locations, but you're pretty much always surrounded by human civilization. There's just, uh, it's a very densely populated country, and, and there's not the sense of just vast emptiness that you get in the USA. And, you know, being surrounded by all that emptiness and all that beautiful land, it raises the contradiction in your mind of the cities you started out from. You know, for me, it was the Bay Area, and I saw thousands of people living in tents and cars without houses. And, you know, it just really, it really makes you think for, for hours and hours on end that there's all this unoccupied land, yes, out in the countryside, but also even in the cities, there are all of those empty houses, six empty houses for every houseless person in the USA. And that was before the pandemic and this big housing crisis we're going through now. So uh, it, it's really, really devastating to think about the the level of disparity in the USA. And, you know, being out there in all of that empty land really brings it home. And it was, you know, that had profound impact on me and it's hard to process that even now. But even though I've experienced housing crisis in my life, I've never actually been houseless myself. And I don't really feel like that's my story to tell. And really, anything that I may have learned about the USA on this trip, uh, it feels kind of irrelevant today. I, I, I don't know uh, what the USA is like anymore. I, I haven't been to the USA since before the pandemic. And I know that COVID has just had such a deep impact on everybody. I, I do feel like the USA that I drove through, for better or worse, it, it was a very different place than the USA that must exist today. I don't know. I don't feel like... Um, I, I, I feel like I have to go back to the USA again before I could even really uh, speak intelligently about what that place even is anymore. I, I don't I don't even know. I, I've only got this perspective from the other side of the planet living here in Vietnam. It just doesn't feel like a story that I can tell right now from this particular vantage point. So how can I tell this story? Perhaps it's not just one story. Perhaps it's a lot of stories. Perhaps to really tackle something like this, I would need to revisit these experiences again and again from different perspectives. I, I could do a whole video just about, you know, all the different kinds of food you can eat in the USA. I do another video about how different 100 degrees Fahrenheit feels in Colorado desert versus in a Missouri swamp. I could do a whole video about, you know, those conversations that I had. There was this one time that I stopped at a Hardee's somewhere in the prairies of Utah, and I met this group of World War II veterans. Uh, they were all like very, very old, and they had been meeting to drink coffee in the morning at this Hardee's, I guess, like every day for years and years and years. And, um, you know, I, I could talk about those, the strange conversation I had with them and the strange contradiction between their war stories about fighting Nazis in Germany to defeat fascism there 
and the Make America Great Again hats that they were wearing and their enthusiasm for Donald Trump getting rid of all the Muslims. Uh, you know, I, I could definitely do a whole video about that conversation and that experience with those people and, you know, the contradictions that they didn't seem to be aware of in their younger lives versus the, the, the manifestations of their political views in 2017. I could do a whole video about the eerie tension I felt as I rolled through the really extremely indescribably beautiful landscapes of the USA and all their variation and the realization that was constantly there in my mind that all of this land, this beautiful land was stolen through obscene acts of violence and genocide and that that genocide was being carried on, you know, up until that day. And, and of course, obviously, even to this day where I'm, where I'm reading this now. And this internal conflict between that experience of magnificent beauty and freedom on American highways and the gut rot knowledge that it was all built at great expense to the peoples who are indigenous to the land, uh, it's, it's a terrible feeling. And I don't think we really have words for that in English, perhaps by design. The closest word I can come up with might be from Korean. You know, one of the words that I learned uh, living in Korea, uh, it's this word Han which loosely translates as a feeling of regret, sorrow, and injustice that can never be fully rectified. Now, Han has a deep and wide meaning in Korean, uh, and I don't even really think that I fully understand it myself, to be honest, uh, but it's often used by Koreans to talk about their collective trauma that came from Japanese colonialism on the Korean peninsula. Uh, it's also used to talk about the experiences of, for instance, like, you know, old women who live their entire lives in abusive relationships and, and now they're reaching the ends of their lives and they look back and they have this feeling of Han. But of course, the feelings of discomfort that I feel as a settler, as I'm gazing upon the beauty of this violently stolen land, it's got to be quite different than the feelings that indigenous victims of this, of this genocide feel. So I guess what I'm feeling isn't Han. It's not, it's not my Han. It's not my place to have that, that feeling. And of course it would be deeply wrong for me to try to center my feelings of guilt or, or my sense of injustice at this. We should obviously center the, the feelings and the perspective of the indigenous peoples themselves. I've got links to plenty of uh, channels and, and literature you should probably read, if you, especially if you're living in the USA on stolen land. But looking at this footage, I just, there's a feeling. I don't know. It's just something that, that I don't know if I can do any justice to trying to articulate. It touches on something that Theodore Adorno wrote. Uh, Adorno was a Jewish socialist who escaped Germany during the Holocaust, and he once wrote that to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. What Adorno meant here was that the atrocity of the Holocaust was so overwhelmingly significant that the scale of human tragedy was so incomprehensible that all human activities which follow the Holocaust must necessarily pale in comparison, and that writing something like poetry, you know, it, it has to, by necessity, be compared, be measured, be weighed against the, the scale of atrocity of the Holocaust. And these are challenging words, uh, especially for somebody like me who, you know, I, I consider myself an artist. I want to make uh, poetic things, whether they're videos or, or, you know, my writing or whatever, I want to be poetic. I want to be creative. Uh, but I live after Auschwitz. So again, these words were very challenging when I first read them. And my immediate instinct was to reject them. And when I was traveling through the USA in 2017 and I was shooting this footage, I'm very certain that I would have absolutely rejected this notion that to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. But since completing the trip, I've absorbed a lot more information about the experience of the indigenous peoples of this land, which includes reading some indigenous literature, studying indigenous history, and having at length conversations with indigenous people. And now when I look back at this beautiful footage of this so-called American landscape, Adorno's words start to make a little more sense. What does it mean for me to make this video now, showing off these lovely images after all the suffering of the people who were displaced from these very environments that you're looking at? These questions become especially palpable in the context of climate change 
and environmental destruction in the USA. Because if there's one thing I've learned from talking to indigenous people, it's that all they really want is for this land to be preserved. All they really want is custodianship of this land, to, to be able to take care of the land as they did for centuries before we came and stole it from them. Right now, the West Coast uh, is burning with, with massive wildfires. And it's sobering for me to think of the ways in which indigenous peoples were able to manage and preserve these same ecosystems, again, for centuries in harmony with nature. And now in the wake of the IPCC report, which shows that climate change is going to be even more devastating and immediate than we ever believed before, Adorno's words ring out as I look at this footage. And the echoes of my conversations with indigenous comrades like Silver Spook, Lost Sioux, Twin Rabbit, and so many others, and especially their pleas to preserve this precious, beautiful land from the destruction and corruption which we've unleashed through our horrifying mechanisms of capitalist industry, of this, of this capitalist system of greed and devastation. And if I wanted to go back and do this motorcycle trip again today, or if you wanted to go and take the same trip that I did, the same route, there's no way that that would be possible. Because right now, you know, many of these roads that I that I drove through, these forests that I drove through, they're on fire right now. Uh, the, you know, California and Oregon has so many of these massive fires now, you could not take the same trip today. And that is because of the pathetic mismanagement and improper development of land, which we have under capitalist settler rule. And if I took the trip again, you know, in a year or two, it wouldn't be the same because these environments are being so utterly devastated. And many of the beautiful, beautiful things that I saw on this trip will be no more. So if Adorno is even remotely correct in his assertion that to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric, what can that mean for a travel video on YouTube indulging in a life-changing narrative of freedom and self-discovery of a white dude traveling across this stolen land? How can I tell the story?